Well, good morning, everybody. That uh, Francesca asked us if we would give a talk, and we said, yeah, we're good at that. We've done it before. So uh, we've done it before, haven't we, Joe? Hello, Joe. Hello, Mike. Hello, Robert. Hello, Mike. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, he also suggested that we've done it before so many times and talked about the past that uh, you people probably don't want to hear it as old fogies talking about the past again. He said, well, can you talk about the future? And we said, well, we're old fogies. We don't know anything about the future, but we can, in we can invent the future for you. So um, I thought I'd start, and I'd start talking a little bit of what I know about, which isn't much. Uh, and where are we today as far as Erlang and OTP is concerned? Well, a lot of people are actually using Erlang. I mean, if we go back to when we worked with Erlang in the 1980s, 1990s, I never could have believed that I'd stand here in San Francisco and sit a complete hall of people talking that. It, it, I find it quite amazing. And I firstly would like to thank you all for being here and using Erlang. I think it is amazing. I am very mm -hmm. pleased and very happy for, for that. I'm proud. The other thing is, if you look at them, you look at the companies which are using Erlang, we put the one which made most money out of it first, because that seemed most logical that um, WhatsApp, $19 billion, that is incredible. I think it even caused some of the sleepy management at Ericsson to wake up and say, what's this, some company on $19 billion? Good God, what have we done? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, then, of course, there are other companies that uh, someone told me the machine zone are making a, a million dollars a day selling their app and their kind of say, I I don't use computer games myself, but I think that's incredible. I'm not going to go through all the list, but it's a long list, and I'm sorry that I've probably forgotten some uh, people here who probably feel offended that their names are not on the list, and so I apologize for that. And uh, there are some big names which are actually using Erlang, but uh, they don't like us to talk about it, so we won't. At least, we won't do it loudly, especially not while being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> So what do they do? That uh, messaging in various forms, um, control mobile telecommunication systems. That uh, Ericsson has 45% of the mobile cellular infrastructure in the world running through Ericsson systems. Uh, if you make a, if you're using data uh, on uh, your mobile phones, you almost certainly at some stage during the day are using Ericsson equipment, and that Ericsson equipment actually uses Erlang to transport the data. Not the data, the data path is actually done in C, but the, uh, the um, control is done by Erlang. So you're using Erlang every day, although you don't know it. Uh, network management, that uh, my friends at the computer science lab, when they uh, disappeared and formed their own company, landed up eventually in a company called TLF, which was bought by Cisco, and are now using Erlang to manage enormous networks of routers and similar things. Banking, I never would have believed that banking is that. There are at least two companies doing banking uh, with uh, Erlang, and uh, one of them, Vocalink in Singapore, is a name I can mention, the others I probably can't. Uh, database management, we have Basho doing React. That uh, again, this is something we never dreamed it would be used of when we first worked with Erlang. Online gaming. That uh, the latest one. He likes that. He likes games. Uh, <laughs> I don't. Um, that uh, several companies doing on online gaming, online advert brokering with AdRoll. And a lot of other things. I'm sure there are, the list could go on and on. A lot of things we don't even know about. And uh, oh, this thing's getting. Oh, it's done it again. Uh, yeah, it's Joe's machine. He, he, does, he, 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 likes, he, he likes these funny things called Macs. I refuse to use Macs. Uh, I, refuse to use, uh, I refuse to use either Windows or Macs. I use uh, Ubuntu on my Linux system and nothing else. That's a sort of matter of principle and a serious inconvenience as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what do these applications have in common? Uh, they're all server applications, which is right. They're all multiprocessor, most of them are multiprocessor. They all serve 
huge numbers of concurrent transactions. The uh, zero downtime, making fault tolerant systems, a lot of them use that, some of them don't, a lot of them use that, but uh, that's, that's all there. And we're not really surprised about that because that's actually what we designed Erlang for. And what we actually designed Erlang for back in the 1980s, 1990s, strangely enough, fits very well for the modern paradigm of distributed computers, multi-core computers, and uh, the internet. We didn't know that at the time. So I can only think that we were either clairvoyant or we were extremely lucky. I think being extremely lucky is probably more accurate. It's important to understand, and I think this is one of the reasons that uh, some companies don't use Erlang, that you can't use Erlang for everything. It fits the bill entirely for the applications I was discussing. But even all these applications have got little bits of C and uh, web browsers re using other technologies in them. It doesn't work very well for number crunching. It doesn't work very well for uh, digital signal processing and that sort of application. But nowadays, I think we've reached an understanding that when you build systems, you use different technologies for different parts. And, um, I think that's really well understood nowadays, but it certainly was not understood uh, 10, 20 years ago when people thought everything should be written in C++ or everything should be written in Java, that uh, we understand that different parts require different technologies. Uh, graphics is another example that uh, you shouldn't, you, you really can write, do, do graphics in airline, but there are a lot easier ways to do that. You don't like WXWitch? WXWitch, it sucks. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe we should actually start working on these areas to get some decent graphics you use airline wide. I don't know. I, I'm quite happy as we are. I think that most of us are. Just as long as there are companies earning 19 billion from it, I wish they'd give some of that money to me, but that's a different matter. <laughs> okay. Now it's over to Robert. Yeah, it's on. Um, we were lucky, you were brilliant. <laughs> um, my comment to that about the properties of Erlang and what's useful, I think um, there have always been a lot of applications which have actually needed these properties. It's just taken quite a bit of time for people to realize that they do actually want it. They do actually want massive concurrency in their systems. They do actually want fault tolerant systems and all the things that Erlang can provide. They probably sort of, again, this is all my opinion, they probably sort of realize, know they want it, but they haven't specifically come out and said they want it. Now they're getting out of the field. That they're, that they're coming out and say, yes, we do need massive concurrence. We do need fault tolerance, and that's how Alan gets into the sites. So what I was going to talk a bit about, um, just some personal experiences in teaching Alan and training. So I do quite a lot of training. I honestly enjoy it, so there's no problems there. Um, just some experiences from this. So the short answer about all this, I could just say it's easy. Right? And, and honestly, it is. It, it is honestly quite easy to teach Erlang and teach people to use Erlang. Um, I don't want to just go down now and leave you, but so I'll go a bit more. But this, these are my experiences from teaching it. Okay. The longer answer is that there are a couple of problems doing it. There's some major problems and there's some lesser problems doing these type of things. Some of the major problems are, our is a functional language. And if you don't come from a functional background, a lot of people, there are things in the functional um, language model which people find difficult. This is nothing strange. It's just, there are different things. Uh, working with a concurrency model, a lot of times people are not used to thinking in massive processes, thinking in asynchronous communication, all these type of things for it. And another problem is, how do I use all this to develop my architecture, my application architecture? Again, it's amazing. all these things are rethinks from what you're used to, say, if you're coming back from a Java, if you're coming from a Java background or something like this. It's nothing strange, it's just some properties. So from the functional point of view, we have things like immutable data. 
which when, after you become used to it seems very natural. But if you're not used to it, it forces you to re, uh, rethink how you work with data. Yes, you can use a lot of the old algorithms, but the way you do it changes. Um, and again, it takes some getting used to. It's not difficult, it just takes some getting used to, and that's not from your background. You have things like pattern matching, which is really fantastic when you, used to use, when you use it, but it's completely different from what most people are used to. If you're coming, say, from a NOO background, you're much more used to saying how I want to pull something apart and check its structure and extract values from it rather than using pattern matching, I just write down the pattern and let the system do it for me. Now. It's the same thing when you're building data. We write down how we want the data to look and the system will build it for us. With pattern matching, we write down what we want the thing to look like and let the system do the testing and the pulling apart and extracting all these type of things. It's not difficult, it's just different from that point of view. Um, another one is recursion. So anyone who's used our language or any of the languages based on the Erlang machine, um, for, you know there are no loops. You're doing everything in recursion. Um, again, that's nothing strange, but if you're coming, say, from an OO background you're using C, you've been told recursion is bad, avoid recursion, it'll kill you. We're saying exactly the opposite. Everything's recursion. You have to use recursion everywhere. There are, there are a lot of other things too as well, but these are all just standard functional language properties. So this is nothing strange for Erlang. So for example, if you've been, um, say, studied Haskell or something like this, all this is quite natural. The syntax will be slightly different, but the, all the properties are basically the same. Another one's the concurrency model. Just this fact thing that you're, how do I look in architecture? Yes, I start splitting things up in processes. I have asynchronous communication between the processes. That is, can be different for very many people. We don't do things synchronously across processes. Um, the selective mess receiving of messages. Again, that's a rethink. It's not like you have a channel where you have to take every message that comes. I can be very selective and just look at the messages I want to uh, in this, where I am in this code. That's a very nice feature when you start getting used to it. Because, well, in effect means I don't have to worry about every message I could get everywhere. I can just worry about the message that I'm interested, I will ignore all the other ones and someone else will clean up after me or take care of the message, those messages somewhere else. Again, it's a rethink of how I understand communication. There's no shared state. This is the big one, I think. Um, there is no shared state between Erlang processes. They're RETS tables, but they're not shared. They're commonly accessible, but you're not sharing data. And again, this is a, a big rethink of how, how you structure your system. Processes are independent. If I want to communicate, if I want to send data, I have to use messages. Again, back to my asynchronous messages. If I want to do synchronous calls, it's sending messages backwards and forwards. This is actually very powerful. The, the, the explicit handling of synchronous messages because it allows me to handle um, errors or properties of my synchronous communications very explicitly. I mean, I can put a timeout out there and say, if I don't get a reply within five seconds, I will go do something else. Or if the other node I'm talking with, or the process I'm talking with crashes, I can go and do something else. And what I want to do, let's see what happens here. Yeah, is very much up to me. Eventually, eventually consistent. So yeah, um, application architecture. How do I build a system architecture? Again, um, when you, if you're looking, if you're say coming from a Java background, when I structure an architecture there, I start thinking in classes and instances of classes and things like this. If I'm coming to an Erlang um, world, I start thinking about processes. Which concurrent activities have I got going? Which process have I got going? Who is communicating with who? Et cetera, et cetera. It's a completely different way of structuring the system. And again, it takes getting used to, especially when you start putting in the fault tolerance. So typically, um, when you're doing an Erlang systems or Erlang based systems, you start thinking about errors very early in the system. This is part of the, how you structure the architecture. What happens when this process crashes? How important is it to recover? How should I recover? Can I just ignore the process crashing? 
Do I have to clean up after it, et cetera, et cetera? And you start thinking this through for every class of processes when you're building your architecture. Of course, that is often not what you're used to doing. So I've heard people say they've never thought as much about errors as when they're building Erlang systems. Of course, the, the reason to do this is that once you've done this, then I can ignore the errors in the processes. Then I can happily let things crash because my system is structured in such a way that it'll clean up after it. From the Allen point of view, that's completely natural. Why? The only way to build a fault-tolerant system is to think about what's, what, what will happen when, when things go wrong. How am I going to structure my system for that? But again, it's a rethink. There are some lesser problems. Syntax, honestly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> I will say most people think the syntax is strange the first time they look at it. But there are a couple of big buts here. Um, most functional languages have strange syntax. Okay? Name a functional language that has a consistent syntax that looks like something else. They don't. What? Well, yes, okay, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll grant you Lisp, yes, I agree. Um, but it doesn't look like Java. Yeah, but Erlang looks like Haskell. No, it doesn't. It doesn't look like Haskell. It's got similar ideas to Haskell, but it doesn't look like Haskell. Yeah. It, but Haskell looks different. F-sharp looks different. There's nothing wrong with F-sharp syntax, but it's not like anything else you've seen if you're coming, say, from a C-sharp um, world for it. The same with any functional language, they just look different. Any language you don't know has a strange syntax. Okay? The first, the first I'll honestly say, I love Lisp, as people probably know. Uh, the first time I saw, I saw Lisp, it was strange. Right? I could not get used to this. It took a while to get used to the parentheses actually defining structures. But once that was done, it was quite natural. And I say the same thing for every time. The first time you learn a new language, the syntax is always strange. Whether it's Java, whether it's C, whether it's Python, even I'll say whether it's Elixir, the syntax is different. Right? Fine. Nothing strange about this. But what I have found is that um, by the time most people, here again, this is experience from giving courses. So I give quite a lot of training courses on this. By the time that people have grasped the basic concepts, they're used to the syntax. Okay? The, the, the problem is getting people to understand the concepts, and by, the, by that time, they will grasp the syntax. So the, the syntax, honestly, is not a problem. I know it is to some people, if you go out and read the blogs on the net, who, who think that, well, well, because we're using semicolons and they're right, wrong ways, so it's sort of the end of, end of the world type thing for it. But most people don't, don't feel that. When I tell people I give courses that people complain about the semicolons, most of them just laugh. Right? It's not a problem. Um, so yeah, in that sense, teaching our language is not, not difficult. There are some new basic concepts that are different, but that's nothing you can do very much about. I mean, that's why you're coming to our language. What are you coming to our language for, if not for the concurrency and not for the fault tolerance? The sequential language is nice, but I, I wouldn't use it. I'd use Lisp if I wanted to just do plain sequential stuff. You're coming for the concurrency. You're coming for the fault tolerance. That means rethinking how you build systems. That, that, that's about all there is to it. I think that was probably the last one I had. Yes, that was the last one I had. So yeah, it's not a, so teaching Erlang is not a problem. I can say that honestly from experience. Yes, I might be a brilliant trainer, but even so, it's not a problem. <laughs> Hand it back to Mike for talking more sensible things. Well, I don't know if I'm going to talk about more sensible things, but I will talk about other things. Um, these guys, they went on to work with uh, technology and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, in about the mid 1990s, I went into management. You know, management's the nice part of business. You can tell people what to do and don't have to think. It's got its, it's, got its, it's, got its advantages. And uh, because of that, people tend to ask me management type questions, and, um, such as, how do you start a project? Well, it is easy to build prototypes in Erlang. Prototyping is easy. You can get things up and running. And maybe one of the possible disadvantages with Erlang is that even very bad programmers 
can get uh, airline programs working, which means that uh, you know, well, it's far better if they use C++ or Java or something like that, but they never get anything working, which is a lot better <laughs> if they're a bad programmer. Um, the advice I give to people is that if they're making a new system, is uh, build a prototype, try things out in the small, make mistakes with a small team, and iterate until you get an architecture which you like. If you do it that way, it's not going to cost that much. If you actually make an architecture which goes wrong and it requires a lot of workarounds, and, uh, that costs money. And that, when you have a very large system which works, and then you have to re-engineer it, it costs a lot of money because not only do you have to uh, get the uh, system to meet the specification, you have to make a system compatible with all the bugs in the old system and all the weird workarounds that people have. That is, I've, I've met that on several occasions and it costs a lot. So rewrite your code, redo it again and again until you're happy and then you can actually speed up and go into a bigger team. It's also very important, and I think uh, I've met a lot of projects where I've made this mistake, of getting people to do the test suites later. And when they do the test suites later, they've actually forgotten all the weird, wonderful things that they programmed in. What if this happens? What if that happens? And these tests are missing. Test suites should be done at the same time. There are people that advocate that you should do the tests before you write the code. I never understood how that would work. But uh, testing should be done at the same space. Uh, and make sure you use tools like Dialyzer from the very beginning. Airline is dynamically typed. Dialyzer will help you with that and get rid of the problems which you, because we don't have uh, typing. You also have to realize there is a huge difference in starting up a new project and maintaining or enhancing an old project. Uh, the difference is mainly the sort of people that you want. You will never get hugely innovative people to maintain a project for 20 years. It just won't happen. The people you want are the sort of steady, loyal people that will do the job and keep it, keep it going. So you need different people and you need people who are prepared to work with the system over a period of years. An innovator who's doing something new, he's got it working, he's happy, he wants to do something new. The maintainer is a different person. They have different goals. The innovator wants to get it working, show how sure his friends is working. The uh, maintainer wants to keep the system running so he's not woken up in the middle of the night by a phone call saying, get into the office quickly, it's crashed. Schedules and project management are different in, uh, in a startup project when you're doing something new. You can have schedules, you can have fixed project management in maintenance and enhancement of a system. You cannot really have sensible schedules for the first time you do something. It's basically you can plan what you know about, you can't plan what you don't know about. This is now over to Professor Joe here. Hello. Um, this is the crystal ball bit. Um, I want to try and think about what happens in the future a little bit. Um, and that's to fit in with the idea that Erlang is developing. It's not static. It changes with time. Um, so I just kind of wonder where the software industry is going and what's going to happen. I don't know. So I'll make a little guess. Um, so. The design of Erlang reflects the period when it was first invented. So it was done in the mid-80s on what today would be, you'd call it a small embedded system. It was on a very tiny computer with a couple of megabytes of memory, maybe, what, a 40 megahertz clock, something like that. Um, Vax 11, 780. Uh, small number of nodes. We talk about tens of nodes, not, not thousands of nodes, and zero security. Um, everything was sitting behind a firewall. Um, no contact with the internet. There wasn't an internet, really. Um, we weren't connected to the outside world, so there were no security problems. And so in, in 1980, we're looking at, OK, so how do, we, how do we map a large number of parallel processes onto a small number of CPUs? 
who talk about building telephone exchanges with hundreds of thousands of users and mapping them onto two or three CPUs. So that's the kind of problem we're looking at then. And there are no security problems. Um, today, we want to map billions of things onto maybe millions or billions of computers. Um, and security is a really big problem because they can all communicate with each other. So, so the problem is changing with time. Um, so this is the kind of universal S-curve that you can use in any talk. You've just got to put some axes on it and label it. So, <laughs> so this is time. It goes like this. And this is hardware. Hardware changes. So I believe that, that um, when the hardware changes in computing, you make a new computer hardware, then the software lags behind and it will catch up. It takes it quite a long time to catch up and it goes through an S-curve. So, so this is the amount of code that's written to support the new change in hardware. So when there's a discrete change in hardware, you'll see a rapid... Well, first of all, you won't see much because people will ignore the new hardware. And then people will start adapting the new hardware and there'll be rapid changes. And then you will go up this steep curve and then it'll tail off because at that point you can't do anything more to the software. Um, so the point in time where people earn money are not here, not at the beginning. That's where you lose money. Okay. But when it takes off on this knee of the curve and possibly in this part of the curve, that's, that's where you make money. And if you're early, you make money when you're on the flat bit at the top, and then you make money forever. You make a small amount of money that's forever until the next technology comes along and replaces you. So you have a constant income out of this bit here, and if, you're, if you time this right, you make a heck of a lot of money in the beginning. I think that's why WhatsApp made a lot of money, because they were the first people to notice that the internet was changing from wireline access to mobile access, and they got in real early there. So they're at exactly the right point on this curve where it takes off. Okay. And then other people will be behind them. Okay, so they won't make as much money, and then hopefully they'll be in this position at the top where they're in this stable plateau, and they'll make money forever until a new technology comes along that's better than that. That's what I think is going to happen. Right. Oh, dear. Come back. Come back slides. All is forgiven. There we go. Hello. Yeah. Right. So, when the hardware changes, the software will, will change. And what we saw up from 1948 to about oh, turn of the century was von Neumann architectures. All that happened to them was the clock rates got faster and the chips got bigger. Um, they reached a limit there when you couldn't reach the entire chip in one clock cycle. And so the multi-cores came along. At that point, there was a kind of discrete break. You couldn't reach the entire chip substrate in one clock cycle, and so the multi-core came along. There was a brief delay while people regrouped and built multi-cores, and, and then the multi-core architectures came along. So it's a discrete change in the hardware. So now the von Neumann machine, which has just got faster and faster and faster from 1948 to, well, say, 1998 or something like that, uh, that trend is broken. So we have a discrete change in hardware. So it's one of these curves changes. The other thing that happened was the ubiquitous data everywhere, the internet that's reaching everywhere, fixed rate access, fibers to the home, things like that. The data rate's going up from kilobytes to megabytes. So, so now, you know, I've got 100 megabits per second at home over a fiber um, in the mid 80s, something like that. I mean, the first modem we had was, oh, what was it, four kilobits or something? No, that was a fast one. 12, no, 1,200 board. Yeah, 110 board. That 110 board is no good for sharing movies and things, I can tell you. <laughs> and it wouldn't fit on the disc because the disc wasn't big enough. <laughs> yeah, apart from in Pembrokeshire, where, where Mike lives. Uh, you're up to a kilobit or something. <laughs> right. Okay, so, so there's this curve, and we're catching up on it, and, and the, I reckon kind of good enough is the point you want to be at, because once you're good enough, you don't need to get a lot better than that. I think, I think things are going to stop at, I don't know why I should want a gigabit at home. 100 megabits per second mobile is okay for me. Right. Okay, so software is, is the same. Um, hello, come back slides. Software is the same. It follows this S-curve, only it's much slower. It takes a long time to adopt the ideas, so... So it, uh, 
took 91 years. Alfonso Church did the, did the Lambda Calculus in 33, and in 2014, Java 8 got Lambdas, which was only 91 years later. And uh, so, uh, you know, we're really slow compared to the hardware people, and, and uh, functional programming is even worse. Um, Got, Gottlob Frege um, defined what was probably the first, the first functional programming system in 1879, but he didn't have a computer to test it on, and so the, the development was pretty slow, and, and the, the first computers weren't powerful enough to run these kind of stuff, so um, there's a bit of a delay there. Right. So if my thesis is that hardware changes will drive software, I want to say, well, what are the hardware changes that... that uh, are going to happen. So, so, so this is where I take out my crystal ball. And, and I, I'm not going to look more than five years ahead because I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, maybe we will have neural nets that, that simulate the brain and things like that. I don't know. But, but let's look at the near-term changes. Well, what we're going to see, I think, are these massive network-on-chip, system-on-chip architectures uh, with, with thousand-core uh, CPUs. Uh, where's Andreas? Oh, he's not here. Oh, right at the back. Yes. So, so go, and, go to Andreas's talk and he'll tell you about the where, where the CPU architectures are going. I think, I think we'll see, say, 800, 800 general purpose CPUs on a chip with 100, 100 200 um, hardware accelerators. The hardware accelerators will be doing things like, like visual processing, audio processing, fast Fourier transforms, things like that, where, where there's a significant benefit of doing it in hardware. And, and all we have to do is program these things. They'll run at fairly low power, and we will have massive computing power. Um, we're going to see petabytes of local storage. We've already got terabytes of peta storage. The storage is increasing by a factor of 1,000 every 10 years. So we'll see petabytes of storage pretty soon, and then exabytes. And I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what we're going to do with all this storage. They, they, they seem like uh, nuclear weapons um, in the sense that what happens to the film industry when you've got petabytes of storage? I mean, you can store all films in 12 petabytes. Um, you can store all books in 138 terabytes. So I think within 10 years, we'll, have, we'll be able to have all books on, on our mobile phones or something like that. And so, so once you've got all books, why do you want more? You know, there isn't any more. We've, we've, we've got it. Um, and everybody in the world can have it, and that, that's fantastic. We might see vol non-volatile memory. Um, if that happens, uh, then the time to boot an operating system will be just one clock cycle, and, and we'll boot in one clock cycle. Um, It'll be pretty quick, pretty nice. We'll see high-speed communication, massive, massive number of connected devices. So in this hardware landscape, I, I talk to the hardware people, and they say, um, memory is free, CPU is free, and communication costs. The big cost is in communication. And if you think about it, that means that, well, today, the, the dominant model of computation is that we move data to computation. So we have data, we have servers that perform computations and we move the data to the computation. And then we perform the computation, and then we move the result back. Well, that is stupid. Because if you, if you think about it, if, if I have to shift a gigabyte of data to a server for it to perform a computation, but the computation is a program that's maybe 100 kilobytes, it would make much more sense to move the computation to the data instead of moving the data to the computation. And, and so this is the idea of mo mobile programs and agents, actually, because because uh, there are compelling reasons why you don't want to you why you don't want to move the data, and one of the reasons is, is Carl's reason about privacy. That 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 uh, if you've got your data, you keep it on your own server at home, and then you allow agent programs to have access to subsets of that data. And now you're moving the computation; you're not moving the data. So there are compelling privacy reasons to do so, but there are also compelling environmental reasons to do that because moving that data is the part of the process that takes up most energy. So we have to solve the world's energy problems. With the, the moving, the, the world's data centers are using 4% of the world's energy, and that is the same as the airlines are using, okay? And that is increasing at 16% per year. That is an environmental disaster. If we can put the data locally on our machines, and move the computations to the data, we can save a lot of that energy, okay? So Carl has been completely right with his agents, saying you move computations around the net to agents rather than moving the data around. And these spawn off new agents which perform new computations. Okay, so we have to do that. Right. What's happening in the place of the world where I'm looking at are the data rates for mobile data. And uh, since I work for Ericsson, among other things, <laughs> um, we can see that 
we've had this development in the last, when did 2G start? That was 1980s, yeah? Uh, every 10 years, we've gone through this 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G cycle, um, and that has increased a thousand-fold communication capacity every 10 years with a, a 10 to the 6 price decrease per bit. Right now, we're trying to define 5G. Um, that will give us about a gigabit per second in hot, well, 5 to 10 gigabit per second in hotspots and 100 megabits per second everywhere. This nomadic data, uh, things will be running at 100 megabits per second. I don't actually see why you would want more data rate than that because that, together with caching, um, gives you a situation where it would be very, very difficult to, be, to do better than that. And I'm not quite sure. I, I don't have enough imagination to think what we would do with that. Unless we start simulating the brain or doing sort of really... Suppose we try and optimize all of society, build a model with everybody on the planet in order to, to optimize energy usage. I mean, that, that might need massive computing power. Um, yeah. All right, so what else are we doing? So the new problems, well, what new problems come out? Well, we've got 50 billion connected devices or a trillion connected devices. We've got 1,000 core computers. Uh, we have limited energy. Uh, we have limited radio bandwidth, um, and we have to figure out how to use these resources. Um, what do I say? This is the new hardware landscape. This is where we'll be in, I'm going to say, we're not going to be in, well, we might be there in, have we got 50 billion connected devices today? I don't know. No, not there yet. 5G, well, I have to say that because I work for Ericsson. Uh, that's, that'll be around 2020. We've already got five gigabits per second uh, over the air in the lab. Um, that will be rolling out about 2020, something like that. 1,000 core CPUs running at about 15 watts. Oh, Andreas. Um, um, my prediction is they will be around... I wouldn't be surprised if somebody came with them this year or next year. You know, I've, always, I've been saying that for the last two or three years. Um, I really want to be the first person to get a 1,000 core computer on my desk um, to program it, because some people say, we don't know how to program 1,000 core computers. And I would say, no, we don't know how to program 1,000 core computers, but I want to be first to try out how, how it works. And, and uh, okay, CPU power is free, memory is free, communication costs a lot, and energy costs, to really look after energy. So what are the new software problems managing? I don't see 50 million connected devices. I see 50 billion crypto keys that have to be managed. And, you know, how do we make it safe? Oh, there's one key to all 50 billion devices. And I'll give it to Mike, and then he'll lose it or something. <laughs> lose it in the pub in Pembrokeshire somewhere. <laughs> um, we've got all the software. Yeah, this, is, this is a system that's going to be totally and always inconsistent. You, you know, you know we, we, all the kind of software managers stop the system, change the software, restart the system. I'm going to do it with 50 billion connected devices. It's always going to be inconsistent. Um, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let, stop, stop every computer on the planet, upgrade everything, restart it all. <laughs> um, then then we've, got to, we've got to program these thousand core thingamajigs with hardware accelerators. That's going to be fun. Um, we've, we've also got to fix up all this old stuff, all this total me billion. We, I said in the, another lecture that you know, we, we should... We who've, been, we who've got grey hair in the audience should get medals for writing all this stuff that, that people in the future will have to be backwards compatible with. So we, we've created billions of jobs. Either that or we can just sort of just throw it all away and rewrite it, which I think Alan Kay wants to do, which is possibly a good idea. Um, yeah, I mean, it is actually, yeah, it is, yes. So we've got to fix up all this old mess. We, we've, got to, we've got to save energy. And we've got to understand complexity. I mean, Dijkstra was saying, you know, the com Computer science is all about controlling complexity. And, and complexity doesn't hit you when you've got a few, you know, any fool can make a program with a few lines of code. Um, but it, it, programs get complex very, very quickly. So as a, as a thought exercise, I, I would ask you, um, let me see, how many 32-bit variables has the same entropy as the number of atoms on the planet? Give me a number, somebody. Nobody. Yes. No, 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 no. Far too big. <laughs> a smaller number. 
No, 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 no. With one 32-bit variable, there's two to the 32 combinations that that can have, and we can exhaustively test all of them. That's easy. Six. Six integer variables in C. Two to the power of six times 32 is greater than 10 to the 75, which is the number of atoms on the planet. So we could prove by exhaustive, or we could exhaustively test programs that have less than six integer variables in. But you can't write complex software like that. So we have to turn to mathematics and things like that to prove that. We need to control complexity. Um, and we've, we haven't done a stunningly good job on that in the past. So, so, uh, so I think it's better to have this model that says that all the software is going to fail. This is the Erlang model is, you know, process is going to fail and uh, somebody else has got to fix that up. Uh, it's not, it's not going to work any other way. Right, so the future. Um, Systems have to be self-managing. The, the, the notion of managing 50 billion of these devices um, is, is ludicrous. Uh, so things like version control, security, authentication, privacy are key problems. Um, Self-repairing, stuff's got to repair itself. Or, uh, like the brain, if you knock out a bit of the brain pff, like that and have an accident, if you're lucky, uh, it will regenerate after a year or so. Um, computers don't do that. You know, if we, if we take a CPU and bang a hammer through it uh, and wait a year, it doesn't repair. We, we, things happen while we sleep. I'm trying to imagine algorithms that, that, uh, that sleep. You know, they need eight hours a day of good sleep, and, and then the, the next morning they're kind of more perky and, and, and things like that. <laughs> well, no, if you, if you do some of these machine learnings, latent Dirichlet allocation and things like that, they, you, they could observe what you're doing during the day and try to learn from it, and it might take you eight hours of good, good good sleep with a nice bed, and then the next morning it wakes up and it's all perky and it's figured out all this stuff that you didn't know the day before. I think we're going to have to go and look at the brain for, for inspiration. Um, we, we need to be energy aware. Right, right now, um, we don't have measurement points on the chips to see where the energy is going. We don't have measurement points out in the network. So uh, we need to be measuring, uh, not... not um, uh, what do we measure? Bits per second or something like that. We, we need to be measuring um, gigabytes per gram of CO2 when we transfer it to a data center or something like that. Um, so, so we can figure out what's happening. Because we don't want to dig up this brown stuff and burn it and, 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 uh, and uh, then use it to, to tweet about Lady Gaga or something. There, there, there are actually better, there, there are better uses for this brown stuff. Um, plastics and the pharmaceutical industry need it, but, but we don't need it to generate energy. Um, and we need to solve the privacy problems. Um, different people have different views on which problems are the most important. I, I believe that energy is the most important. And uh, where's Erlang today? Oh, that side didn't come up. Uh, yeah, well, I think it's the language of choice for programming soft real-time distributed applications. That's what it was designed to do, and it fits the bill quite nicely. Um, it's the language of choice for programming multi-core, apart from, I would say, the, these um, GPU DSP type applications. Not, not very good at that. In fact, completely rubbish at that. Um, been tested and battle tested for quite a long time. Um, I'm going to say with self-repair, the, the, the supervision trees and things give you a sort of way of self-repairing, but it's not self-repairing like the brain. It's just kind of choosing between pre-programmed scenarios that you figured out in advance um, and just, just trying them and then failing and trying another one. Um, it's not actually mutating. So we, perhaps some machine learning or something inside that would, would do it. Uh, as Mike said, it's great for prototyping distributed systems and great for managing systems. And so, yeah, I'm glad you quoted Alan because he couldn't be here. So, so, so I just say, well, the best way to predict the future is go and invent it. So there you go. Go out and invent some stuff. Right, now that is the end. Apart from we're going to have a quarter of an hour of questions, but no, we're five minutes overdue. So, so um, yeah. So, how, when do we have to stop? Well, say, give me a number. Give me a number. Fifteen minutes. Okay, right. So now we, I, I become interrogator who asks you some questions, right? And 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 then the idea is, I've got a list of questions here that I'm going to ask them and me. Um, and the idea is we hope that you will then start joining in and asking your own questions. I have a reserved list of questions that I'm going to use in case you're all very shy and don't ask any questions. <laughs> and, I, and I have an obligatory question. Oh, well, Joe, it was like this. We thought that if we stood up here, that we'd be embarrassed if no one asked any questions. Yeah. So to make it a bit easy, we'd ask questions to each other. Right. So, so, so I, have, <laughs> I have the obligatory question that I'm going to ask all, all three of us. And, and that's 
what's the worst? What's the worst Really bad. It really sucks. What's the worst thing? That, that's a tough one. Um, 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 <laughs> the worst feature. No, records are fine. There's no problem with records. No problem. Okay, everyone complains about records, and I say, okay, come up with an alternate syntax, and I never, I never get one. Right? No one has been able to come up with an alternate syntax for records which actually works. So don't complain about them. Um, variable scoping. That, I would say, is the worst. Yes, we can argue with Joe and I. We don't agree no, no, on that's that. That's good. That's great. Yeah. So people, okay. People complain about the syntax and the semicolons and the variables starting with capital letters and other stuff. But they don't complain about the real problem in the Alang syntax, and that's variable scoping, or rather lack of it. No, that's no, 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 no. no, that scoping's great. The, show, the programs are shorter because of it. Yeah, I know. You can do really cool and things with it, and yes. It is, and it's easier to compile. No, it's, it's, more more regi register allocation. it's more difficult to compile. Yes, it is. Completely wrong. Okay, sorry. Okay. He's an idiot. Oh, hang on. What's the worst? I was tempted to say the semicolon before end, but I know that Robert would hate me if I told them that. <laughs> I'll just discuss it with you afterwards, right? In a quiet corner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, Joe, what's the worst thing in our life? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, well, it's the biffs. Biffs? It's the biffs. Well, because the biffs are... Okay, the NIFs are okay, because you've got your application and you want to interface to some funny C. Um, but the BIFs are things that come with the system, and they're what make it difficult to port it to a new system, because there are hundreds of BIFs. And if, if you look at languages, you look at, you, you know, you don't want this... BIFs are special cases that don't fit into the framework. They're things that are, can't be written in Erlang, and there are loads of them now, hundreds of them. And if you want to port it to do anything else, you've got to port all those BIFs and make sure they all work on your new, new processor and everything. It's horrible. All the BIFs should be thrown away and written in Erlang. Yeah, okay, yes, ask Chris. Now. And, and the next thing that's wrong... <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that whole list. I mean, it's horrible. Um, we, we weren't chucking stuff away. Yeah. So, so um, Nicholas Viet said, you know, every time you add a new feature to a language, you should chuck something away. And we've added new features, and we haven't chucked. So when we put maps in, we should have thrown records away. But there are, other, there are some people... Um. <laughs> oh, because you don't like records. <laughs> the maps, maps don't need records with maps. They're, they're not quite equivalent. Uh, uh, I can agree with throwing stuff away, yes. Yeah. And we did, we were... But there are people who want to be backwards compatible. Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. Is, but I can, we which I have two opinions about. We weren't <laughs> too bad with throwing things away. So when we were developing the language, we did actually put a, put a lot of experimental stuff in, which our users said, no, this was useless, or it was wrong, or it was bad, and we can't use it. We actually did remove things. So we weren't too bad with that, but otherwise I agree, yes, you should be very careful when you add things to remove stuff. Right, my next pre-prime question for Mike, how, how, how do you recruit Erlang programmers? Now that's a question that comes to me frequently, and I tell you that the way, I tell you how not to recruit Erlang programmers that uh, a lot of companies have these uh, personnel departments. They're usually called HR departments. And I hate that expression because they're neither human nor are they resources. <laughs> that, uh, uh, and you go to these departments and you tell them, recruit some airline programmers. And they put an advertisement on the net saying, we want airline programmers. And of course, there aren't that many airline programmers. What they should do, you don't recruit airline programmers, you recruit good programmers. And good programmers can learn any language. And you need people that have a mindset that understands concurrency. And what's more, you have to recruit programmers and you have to use programmers who want to use Erlang. There's a problem that in, in many companies you decide that, OK, we're going to use Erlang for something. We've got this department over here which is not doing something, not, doing, not working, but that product is there. We'll use this department for doing that. And three quarters of the programmers there have spent their life learning some obscure language like C++ and uh, think that that's what they've invested in their future. They think, well, I have to learn Erlang. Well, I have to learn something new. Why should I, why should I strain my brain? So don't recruit programmers. 
program, airline programmers, recruit good programmers who want to do the job. Right, now, now we'll do the audience bit. <laughs> now, I think Elsa is going to ask Robert, what's the worst picture of an airline that you hate that makes it difficult to improve intellectual? Uh, what is the worst picture you We won't change it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, that's really for yeah. Uh, technical and great, thanks. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I, 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 that wasn't pre programmed. <laughs> so, who's got some questions? Well, that conclusively proves that there are no worse features, isn't it? Not bad. <laughs> They're all just as bad. <laughs> Do you, do you think an approach for the BIFs is that a lot of other languages, as they've matured, have, um, they have a JIT, so we have hype. And could we implement them in Erlang and maybe ahead of time compile with hype the BIFs implemented in Erlang so they're still just as fast as the C way? Because like uh, Ruby has done that with JRuby where, or Rubinius where they've pushed more and more of the standard library and the equivalent of BIFs into Ruby by having a really good um, JIT or ahead of time compiler. Yes. There is a, there is a JIT. Um, it's not ready to roll out. It's almost ready to roll out. Uh, Has it got that far now? Yeah, yeah. Frey, Frey's working on it. The two guys um, from the Swedish Institute of Computer Science have been doing it for about a year and a half. And, uh, and uh, they're doing a talk on it at the next day on the user conference. It's more or less ready to roll out, and it's going pretty well. Wow, okay. I didn't know that. Um, I can say one thing. Read the BIFs. If you look in the, in the Allang module, all the BIFs, there are different classes of BIFs. Some of them are there just to make the written C to go faster. So why there are six functions which do um, cycle redundancy checking, I have absolutely no idea because they've got no specific place in the BIFs, but they're there for just to make That's how you put C code in back in the old days. And a lot of the BIFs are looking at internal stuff, in, look, getting internal information out of the system. The system info bit, for example, which allows you to get a lot of information out of the system, you could not rewrite that in anything else, because that's looking into the machine. And there's a bunch of bits that know about internal data structures. Perhaps you could do something with those. But definitely some of the bits, I agree with Joe, shouldn't be there. They should be removed, if possible. So, so Robert, what's the story? I mean, how's Erlang fit in with other functional languages? If you learn Erlang, is it going to be easier to learn Haskell? Or? Yes, partially. I mean, we've got the, um, uh, we've got all this functional stuff, right, which is pretty much the same as in most functional languages. Um, we don't have a type system like Haskell does. So a large part of the problem to learning Haskell is learning how to use the typing system, which we don't do. We have types, but we don't have static types. So, yeah. So. Uh, have you uh, encountered imposter syndrome in your careers? And if so, could you talk about that? Again, sorry. Have you encountered uh, or felt imposter syndrome? You mean copycats? Well, what do you mean? No, no, as in um, feeling like you don't belong, like everybody else is better. <laughs> um, I would flip that and say, yes, we don't belong because we're better. Okay. <laughs> so um, I, I could say. During the 80s and early 90s, we, we, we took part in a lot of um, academic conferences in functional languages and in logic languages, and we were often the odd, the odd people out because we, we came from industry and we weren't looking at the academic side of using the languages. We are looking at how to use the languages to make products. So in that sense, we are often sort of the odd man out. Um, yeah. We, you don't belong because everyone is better. I think that explains exactly why I became a manager. I knew I was better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I um, actually, I, I became a researcher kind of late in life because um, I think, how old was I? I have to think. Uh, four, yes, 54. Uh, when I was 54, um, I, 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 I started doing a PhD. And, and Safer Edi, who was my thesis advisor, uh, so I wrote this PhD, and, and um, I didn't know anything about research or anything, so, so I wrote my PhD, and, and then Safe said, um, there's this bit that's related work. And I said, 
well, why do you have to write that? It isn't any related work. You know, I've invented all this stuff. And, 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 and so I, so I, so then say, so, no, well, no, you know, what, what you've done fits into a, a bigger picture. And so I started looking at, at, at uh, what other people had done and trying to see where what we'd done fitted into that. And, and at that point, I realized that, that uh, the difference between research and, and opinions are, are that research can be reproduced and, and, and it fits into it to a bigger picture. And, and, and I was actually quite pleased that I, I did that because, because then I thought, uh, how does this stuff fit together? I hadn't been thinking about that before. Because I've been working in isolation in the lab. We just, we read all these papers. Thought, that's a good idea, we'll steal that. That's a good idea, we'll steal that. So, so there's no creativity involved there. It's just sort of steal other people's ideas, package them together in, in a nice way. But, 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 but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can say what, one thing, talking about what, well, we haven't started talking about what we did wrong, but one thing we did, we did very wrong is that we three, we thought about these problems a long time, had long arguments about things. The discussion about what happens if you send to a process that doesn't exist, that discussion went backwards and forwards for a long time. Honestly, it did. Yeah. And um, we never wrote down a lot of the rationale behind the decisions we made. Uh, now I'm being serious, this is a serious problem. So people do not understand. We have this feature, why do we have this feature? And most of the things in the language, not all, but most anyway, um, there's a reason behind it, we never wrote this down. And that was the, I, the first time um, I wrote something about this 2000 something rather, uh, a short presentation about it, a short paper about it. And I was talking to Joe and I said, well, we'd, never this, we'd never written this stuff down. And he said, no, we didn't, did we? And we just felt it was so natural, we never wrote it down. So if you decide making a system, write down why you've made certain decisions of it. Yeah. It will help you, it will help the next generation looking at it, definitely doing that. The other thing is, it's kind of inconceivable during this 10, 15 year period, the number of users have grown from one to 10 or something like that. So, so it was inconceivable to think that we would have 100,000 or 200,000 users, and, and therefore that there'd be any need to keep this stuff. It was just what we were playing with. So, so I had a whole, and, and we didn't have computers to store everything on, so everything's on paper. And, and I had a big part, and every time we moved, Helen said, uh, oh, can't you chuck all that stuff away? And so every time we moved, I threw half of it away. So, so I had, well, I'm not gonna throw it absolutely everywhere. So I have this box at home marked history. And, and unfortunately, I haven't got the first version of the Verlang. I've got like version five, and, and it says, you know, earlier versions lost in the midst of time, you know, so we never kept anything. Computers then didn't store everything for, forever. Well, my, Actually, that's the interesting we talk about it. We think we've got an early version on a sun. There's a sun where in one of the... don't know how to read. Has anybody got a sun tape reader? You know those little cassette things? <laughs> <laughs> you know those little cassette things you used to put yeah. in sun tape? Anybody's things? got a sun tape reader from the 1980s? Somewhere in the... Early the versions of airing on it. <laughs> the only problem is I have to look somewhere in the mysterious boxes I have and try and find that, but right. I've got it somewhere. <laughs> So, uh, when you first designed the language, what was the motivation keeping it dynamically typed versus going for static typing? Because, um, because it was based on Prolog from the beginning. That's one that implemented Prolog. <laughs> and Prolog is dynamically typed. Uh, yeah, and um, there was some rationale. It made the code, dynamic code handling easier. Because, I mean, the unit of code handling is, is a module. And there's no intermodule links or any connections at all. So if you're loading, you're just loading modules, which makes static type checking the whole system very difficult to do. And we felt there was enough, basically. And that's where we came. And again, we, it's from the prologue where we, what we're working on at the original time. It's quite strange because all of us come from backgrounds with static typing. I mean, so Joe was a Fortran program. Well, sort of static typing anyway. Got uh, Mike and I have program C. Well, I was an assembly language programmer, and I don't think you can talk <laughs> about typing there at all. Well, of course it does. You got, you got the integer. Yeah, okay, yeah. Any more questions?